Thank you, Martina, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, Telehealth 2.0, Developing a Long-Term Strategy. I'm Patty and Rado with HIMSS. With the onset of the pandemic, telehealth adoption soared astronomically out of necessity, but as its growth continues, healthcare organizations can examine how their telehealth platforms and services have performed, and as a result, enable them to develop a long-term effective telehealth strategy post-pandemic. Today, we're going to share with you recent HIMSS research, telehealth and overdrive, intelligence on a year and adaptation, a longitudinal study produced in collaboration with Spectrum Enterprise, which reveals intel about telehealth now and into the future. And today I'm joined by Cliff Dinwiddie, Senior Director of Vertical Programs for Spectrum Enterprise. Welcome, Cliff. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Martina. Really glad to be here today. Team, we are very excited to uh, share with you the results of the research uh, that we are presenting today. We have been at this with our partners at HIMSS for a little over a year now, hearing from provider organizations across the country, in fact, more than 700 of them. Uh, we do these studies with HIMSS to stay on the pulse of what's happening in healthcare, and this particular study couldn't be any more insightful. Uh, I'm thrilled to share with you what we have learned and the insights that all of you uh, have given to us as it relates to telehealth. And today, like with all other research, we're going to show you a pretty high volume of numbers. The numbers are interesting, but Patty and I are gonna work really hard today to pull the insights out of these numbers. It is the insights that are important to all of you, and that's what we are going to focus our conversation on today. So, so Patty, uh, let's get started. Great. So let's get started then. So there's a lot of really great data to share and drive insights from. So first, let's take a look at the overview of the research, the key takeaways and our methodology. As a three-part survey series, our research was conducted from fall 2019 through fall 2020 and was focused on identifying telehealth successes and challenges, insight into service offerings, digital infrastructure, costs, and finally, telehealth strategies moving forward. So as we go through these slides, we're gonna dig into the details, but here are some overarching takeaways to keep an eye out for. So number one, telehealth adoption growth is expected to continue, allowing organizations to now focus on increasing access and diversifying services. Number two, government grant funding and organizational reserves remain top two funding sources. So telehealth is here to stay. So there are several bills in Congress to support telehealth post-pandemic, and organizations are earmarking reserves to keep telehealth growing, and that bodes well for telehealth 2.0. Three, telehealth success and failure is dependent upon patient satisfaction and continued reimbursement. Four, decision-making is shifting toward a long-term approach, with many organizations viewing their information and communication technology, or ICT vendors, as partners. As organizations continue focusing on making telehealth more effective for the long-term, they're really leaning in on their ICT vendors to help them build that strategy. And five, given the above, as a partner, ICT vendors must provide top-level service and consultative support. As our survey respondents noted, high-quality patient and provider experience is critical for continued use, and that's where ICT partners step in to be responsive service providers and hands-on consultants. So later in the webinar, we're going to talk more about ICT vendors, but just want to keep it in the back of your mind, you know, the term ICT vendors um, being information and communication technology vendors. Thanks, Patty. And, and team, if you stare with me at slide three, this is sort of the bottom line on the top. This page is exactly why we are here with you today. We want to share with you the detail around uh, these research findings. And, and, you know, as I indicated, we've been working with HIMSS. We at Spectrum Enterprise have been working with HIMSS for, for years. Uh, and we do research like this actually quite frequently. And we do this to try to optimize the, the level of support that we provide to our healthcare clients, specifically our healthcare provider clients. Telehealth has been on the radar, but uh, for reasons that I think everyone here is familiar with, uh, telehealth has come into a really sharp focus as a result of the pandemic. So Patty, let's dig into the details uh, of exactly who did we speak with? Right, so first, let's orient everyone to this chart. 
So you'll see a similar setup on many of the next views. So each wave of research is represented here as a separate bar. So gray is fall 2019, and that's pre-pandemic. Aqua is summer 2020 during the pandemic. And the dark blue or violet is fall 2020, where HIMSS asked respondents to look forward to post-pandemic and the changes they, that they anticipated going forward. So Cliff, share with us what you're seeing here. What I see here when I squint my eyes and stare at this chart is that we talk to all kinds of providers and we talk to them over different time periods. Uh, we do this because it's really important to take a balanced approach to make sure that the research is actually representative of what all of you in the trenches are, are seeing out there. We checked in with folks over time to understand how these issues, opinions, and considerations have changed as we all move into the next normal. And over the course of this study, we heard from more than 737 of you. This is a very statistically significant sample. And, and the reason that we focus on providers is because obviously providers are actually the purveyors of telehealth. They are just like you. These 737 survey respondents represent you. It is important as we continue to push through the presentation today that you understand these are not Spectrum Enterprises opinions. These are not HIMS opinions either. These are, are your opinions. So Patty, tell us a little bit more about who these 737 respondents were. Absolutely, Cliff. So across all three waves of research, we also saw a diverse mix of respondents. So the latter two survey parts revealed a high level of familiarity by respondents with telehealth and ICT solutions and services. So Cliff, those two things are really important in terms of validating the research that we're talking about and what we're seeing. So diversity among the respondents and their expertise. It's absolutely right, right? These are the folks in the trenches, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, who live and breathe telehealth in their organizations, especially over the last six months. So a moment ago, we told you that we talked to all kinds of provider types. And what you see here on page five is that we talked to lots of people in those different provider types who are sitting in different functional roles. For the same reason that it's important to talk to different provider types, it's important to talk to people who are supporting their organizations in different ways. And again, these are not our opinions, these are your opinions. So now that we know who is telling us uh, the, the feedback in this research, uh, let's, let's get into the what, Patty. Let's, let's, let's hear about what they said. Right. So we're going to start off with the findings around adoption and growth expectations. So our research found that organizations expect to continue growing their telehealth services. So 91% say they plan to increase and or diversify services post COVID. So there was a flurry of activity earlier this year, but this data point shows that we're still moving forward. We're still going to go up over time. And here's the thing. So the virus exposed our need to offer telehealth. In 2018, HIMSS conducted research on patient experience, which was another collaboration with Spectrum Enterprise. And one of the things we discovered was that patients have been demanding more interactivity and more control over their experience, but providers weren't delivering on that demand. So there was a gap between demand for telehealth from patients and providers who are actually offering it. So then the pandemic hit and telehealth became a necessity. It became a practical application. So the future is fundamentally changed. The delivery model is no longer just face-to-face. -face. Patients have to have other options and they have choices. And telehealth is now part of that care delivery mix. You know, Patty, that, that's absolutely right. And, and I don't think anyone on this, on this webinar will be surprised to hear that the pandemic served as a, as a great catalyst for standing up telehealth. The opportunity to deliver care in this virtual way was, was really uncovered. And the pandemic has heightened the need for organizations to be, let's call it crisis ready going forward and have alternative mechanisms of care delivery at their disposal. But even beyond the care during the public crisis, the findings show that providers are finally closing the gap that, that Patty mentioned just a moment ago, that gap between what providers are delivering and what patients actually want as it relates to uh, their patient experience and improving the same. This is actually very promising. So Patty, 
let's look at some of the details around this telehealth adoption. Right, so between February and August 2020, organizations with already existing telehealth programs saw an increase in numbers of visits by 145% on average over pre-pandemic levels. But most importantly, looking forward, organizations expect the number of telehealth visits to continue increasing by 53%. So year over year, it's a huge leap, Cliff, in telehealth interactions. You know, it's true. And, and team, I think I told you at the beginning of our discussion today, we were going to bring a, a bunch of numbers to the table, and we are in fact delivering on that pl promise. But as you stare at page eight, I want you to focus on the right-hand side of the chart. Uh, no, one, uh, no one here will be surprised to see that adoption grew by 145% in the middle of the pandemic. That's interesting. The number on this chart that's important is that 53%. That 53% is about our future. That 53% is about how, how telehealth will continue uh, to proliferate post-pandemic. Again, so say more than 737 of you that responded to this survey. So, so Patty, let's go deeper. Let's get just a little bit more granular. What has happened to the telehealth service line? Right. So over the next few views, we're going to see side by side views of what telehealth services were implemented and what was being planned from fall 2019 to summer 2020 to fall 2020. So first up, let's look at fall 2019 telehealth offerings ranked by what was implemented. So inpatient specialist consultations were being offered by almost 65 percent of organizations, but with planning it goes up to close to 90%. And if you look at midway through the chart, remote wellness visits, nearly 50% of organizations were offering it, but planning brings it up to nearly 80%. So it's something of note, we didn't track the last three services in the first survey. We tracked them in the next two waves of research, but it doesn't mean that these organizations didn't have something in place. So then the pandemic hit. When we add the summer 2020 data in Aqua, we see implementations in most cases far surpassing what organizations were even planning to deploy back in fall 2019. So the exception is in the top three service lines that organizations had already been implementing last year, which still saw a remarkable increase in implementations. So look at mental health. Look at its jump in telehealth usage. This speaks to the speeding up of implementation. So they were already planning to do it, but suddenly the switch was turned on. And of course, we see skyrocketing implementations across other types, other types of care, outpatient specialists, sick visits, remote wellness, the list goes on and on. And this speaks to the necessity of this care modal modality. So as the dust settles, the question is, what are providers planning for the long term? What do they think will happen once this pandemic subsides? So here, let's compare fall 2020 solutions and services with fall 2019 as a year-over-year -year comparison. So what we're looking at is the future of telehealth. So telehealth is no longer a nice-to-have offering, but rather a critical have-to-have. Organizations had to react. They had to solve for the present circumstances, but it's not going away. So this is the future. So if you look at the dark blue or violet bars, what's been implemented and being planned some are holding, some are increasing. So basically we're seeing strategy being played out here and that's decision-making on solutions and services to make telehealth sustainable and to make it a permanent care delivery option. Yeah, you know, Patty, I, I agree with you team. What, what I really like about page 11 is that it talks about our past or pre-pandemic and it talks about our future in the, the dark blue or the, the purple bars on, on the right. So this is pre versus post. And telehealth obviously had to be stood up immediately, but now the industry is wrapping it into a strategic framework, not just a tactical reaction, in order to keep moving telehealth and virtual health overall forward. Um, and just look at those purple or blue bars, right? The dark purple shows what is deployed and not just planned. If you look at the gray versus the purple, these are huge and very meaningful jumps across nearly every single service line. What I find most interesting on this slide is the demonstrated commitment to keep telehealth going across all organization types that we tested, 
health systems, practices, rural and underserved. And we also see a remarkable growth that carries us past the pandemic. And in a few cases, we see that nine out of 10 providers are either planning or implementing services that were far lower on the priority list than they were pre-pandemic. Again, this is in nearly every single service line. So Patty, now that we know the what, tell us a little bit more about the why. Why is this happening? What's driving the adoption? So that's the very important why, Cliff, right? So prior to um, the pandemic, organizations primarily were driven to adopt telehealth for patient care reasons, so improving access to care, outcomes, and continuity of care. So then the pandemic hit and response to the public health crisis joined the top of the list. No surprise there. But note that patient demand rose to number two in summer 2020 and is expected to continue to be a core driver of telehealth adoption. So we talked earlier about this in the webinar about the findings of the HIMSS patient experience study, that there's this big disconnect between what the providers think patients want and what the patients actually want. So the pandemic is the driver that aligned the providers to finally give what the patients actually want. So by fall 2020, nearly 50% of respondents said that responding to patient demand will continue to be a key driver long term. But look at how 67% of respondents for ambulatory care organizations cited patient demand as a key driver versus 45% of all other organization types. So all healthcare organizations are looking to stay viable, but ambulatory care organizations are up against other care options. There are a lot of new non-traditional entrants that have popped up that they really need to offer as many channels of access to care as they can. And telehealth is helping them to do just that. So also note that improving access to care was cited as a top driver by 79% of rural organizations versus 64% of urban or suburban organizations. So the good news is that there is government funding specifically for telehealth that's available to connect rural communities. So Cliff, when you saw these results, what came to mind for you? Well, Patty, you know, everything that, that I see here on this chart really does comport with the quadruple aim, and, and that's about putting patients at the very center, and telehealth is just the latest technology that is poised to meet this initiative. What's most interesting to me is the consistent access priority that you see on this chart. You have to be able to connect with your patients. Before COVID-19, during it, and long after, uh, providers are recognizing that telehealth may be the only way at times to actually connect with their patients across all types of care, chronic, acute, mental health, and with different types of patients, rural, underserved, socioeconomically disadvantaged. With telehealth, you've got a direct conne connection between the patient and the provider. So in order to keep being successful and re retain and even grow adoption, you absolutely have to be able to respond to patient demand, especially during these times. And Patty, as you mentioned, that HIMSS patient experience study that Spectrum sponsored with HIMSS uh, you know, about a year and a half ago showed this gap, this gap between what patients want and what providers were actually delivering. Uh, this pandemic has closed this gap as it relates to telehealth. Uh, now that the, the providers understand this, this might be the only way that they can deliver care, and this is in fact what their patients want. It, it comports precisely with those uh, patient experience research findings. So it's, it's, it's aligned perfectly. Patients are driving this from the outside in exactly as it should be. Exactly, Cliff. So we also asked how organizations are expecting to make decisions moving forward. So on a continuum from guided by a strategy for long-term effectiveness to making decisions solely on immediate needs, 50% of organizations expect to shift toward making decisions, prioritizing long-term effectiveness versus just 28% of organizations in summer 2020. So this is another nod to telehealth being seen as a long-term care delivery platform. So on a continuum from drawing on many perspectives across the organization to developed by a few key stakeholders, organizations expect to rely on more stakeholders to help make decisions about telehealth. So it's really been an evolution. So more stakeholders are coming together to make decisions for a long-term strategy based on telehealth effectiveness. 
<laughs> you know, it's, that's right, Patty, evolution indeed. This, this actually speaks volumes for telehealth's ability to deliver virtual care and support collaboration across care teams, new cross-functional teams that have cropped up in light of the pandemic. And the results that we're seeing here comport with another study that we did with HIMSS on the so-called anatomy of innovation. Essentially, we talked to providers, just like we did in this study, and asked them about their innovation priorities. We asked about what makes innovation successful in a provider organization and what vexes their ability to innovate. What we heard is that collaboration across that organization is absolutely critical. We also heard that IT needs to be a strategic stakeholder at the table. And if you look at page 13 here, that's exactly what this page is saying. Uh, for organizations to stay ahead of the curve and continue attracting and retaining patients, they have to innovate. And that innovation will include telehealth. And in order to innovate, two things have to be true. You have to take a long-term view and you must collaborate across the different functional areas that are impacted. So otherwise, you know, if, if you don't innovate and you don't have this kind of long-term view and this functional collaboration across teams, innovation is really challenging. Uh, and and uh, it's going to be difficult to, to monetize this. Now, Patty, now that we're talking about monetization, let's talk about how organizations are actually paying for telehealth infrastructure. Right, Cliff, and, and that's really important. So let's look at costs. So one of the most important decisions organizations face is how to cover the cost of telehealth. So let's take a look at how organizations are doing this today and are planning for it in the future. So focusing in on the takeaway here moving forward, organizations are first looking at government grants to fund their telehealth programs. So there are more government grants available for telehealth than ever before, and organizations across the board intend to maximize usage of these. Yeah, now, now team, let's make sure that we're all clear about what we're talking about. What we're talking about is funding for the proliferation of telehealth infrastructure, right? Um, so aside from all the COVID specific, specific funding that's out there, the CARES Act and, and things of that nature, look to one of the newest programs that's become available, the FCC's Connected Care Pilot Program which just opened for applications for about a month starting on November 6th. And think about all of the existing programs that are already in place today. For example, the Rural Health Care Program administered by USAC. In 2020 alone, there are over $800 million in funding available to help organizations connect their communities to care. Again, we're talking about funding for the proliferation of telehealth infrastructure. The point? The point is that the government actually does care about this, and it is proving it with the money that they continue to invest in this space. Yeah, it's really clear, Cliff, and it's remarkable to see the shift from drawing on reserves during the pandemic to relying more heavily on government programs. So organizations will keep using reserves in a big way, but during the pandemic, this was an emergency situation across the board for provider organizations. So there wasn't time to write grants. You know, so organizations had to pay for telehealth somehow. So what's really interesting is the level of commitment, and that's proven by their anticipated continuation of drawing on reserves. It, it's true. The, these provider organizations are effectively saying that they really mean it. It is a validation that these providers want to get telehealth right going forward and making and they're making the investment to, to prove exactly that. They could be spending their reserves, Patty, in any number of ways, but the fact that they are putting these reserves into telehealth demonstrates just how important these services are to these providers uh, their clinicians, and most importantly, their patients. Right. That's right, Cliff. And it'll be interesting to see if organizations develop a separate line item for telehealth services, you know, rather than dip into their organizational reserves, you know, in the future. And that, that's something to check up on in 2021. You know, it, it's also important to look at the reimbursement landscape for the variety of services you can do via telehealth. And even though there have been many temporary changes to accommodate telehealth during the pandemic, post-COVID, 
um, 19 organizations by and large expect continued and in some cases growing reimbursements for many of these services. So for example, last month CMS increased the number of reimbursable telehealth services. So that's now up to 104 44 services that are being reimbursed during the COVID-19 public health emergency. You know, there are several bills that are being introduced in Congress for continued reimbursement. You know, as we noted before, telehealth is clearly important to the federal government to serve its constituents. So when these expectations for funding come through, there's going to be even more of an appetite to keep the lights on for these services and innovate for more. So look, for example, at how much of sick visits post-pandemic were covered, and look at coverage in summer 2020 and expectations post-COVID based on what was covered in summer 2020. So it's interesting to note the differences between ambulatory care organizations and other organizations. So sick visits, mental health visits, and post-discharge follow-ups have a higher expectation for reimbursement at ambulatory care organizations. And that makes total sense because ambulatory organizations have the bulk of these types of visits. But also look at the big jump in funding expectations for remote patient monitoring. And maybe it's a sign that remote patient monitoring is expected to be reimbursed going forward. And that speaks to what's coming next in terms of telehealth services. Yeah, Patty, I, I think you're right. T team, think about what we're talking about here. On the previous page, we talked about the funds that are available for the proliferation of telehealth infrastructure. Now, here on page 16, we're looking for how providers are actually getting reimbursed for services that are delivered over that telehealth infrastructure. It's remarkable to look back at 2019 in gray and look at the huge jump, the exponential growth in reimbursements, and look at it across these, these service lines. The pandemic has certainly been challenging for all of us, but it has also amplified the, this mode of care delivery that's been, frankly, available and underutilized for years. Economics must be a consideration for healthcare organizations but this page makes me happy because it is about providers' belief in the going forward support of these services, their belief in their ability to actually get paid for services that they deliver over this infrastructure. The bottom line is providers have a very high degree of confidence that they will be paid for telehealth delivered services. So Patty, now that we've talked about how the infrastructure gets funded and we've also talked about how services get reimbursed, let's talk about how providers are thinking about the ways to measure their success. Right, so let's take a look at telehealth successes and challenges so far. So right now, providers are still focused on the public health crisis making success measures primarily reactive, but looking forward, how are organizations planning to measure the success of their telehealth initiatives? So the top three they plan to use as a proxy for success are patient satisfaction, reimbursements, and outcomes. You know, as I, as I look at these metrics, Patty, they all make perfect sense to me, and they're all interrelated. Um, there's this idea of patient demand. Uh, and patients won't continue to demand, they will continue to demand this stuff if they're not satisfied. And it's about patient outcomes. Squint your eyes, team. Look at the left-hand side of page 18. You've got patient satisfaction, you've got reimbursement, which is about covering costs, you've got outcomes, and you've got provider satisfaction. Well, interestingly, that is the quadruple aim. <laughs> the top uh, four metrics that providers say they are going to use to measure their telehealth efficacy happen to align perfectly with the quadruple aim, which shouldn't really be a surprise to any of you gathered here. Now, Patty, now that we've talked about success metrics, let's dive into what we learned about some of the challenges that these providers are having. 
Right, Cliff. So we've looked at the success metrics. Now let's look at the challenges, specifically how they've changed from fall 2019 to fall 2020. So from the three waves of research, we see a marked change in terms of top challenges for implementing telehealth initiatives. You know, from lack of comprehensive reimbursement policies and patient awareness adoption to more patient-centric, hands-on, technology-based challenges. So the trend went from economic drivers to patient-centric drivers. The patient's lack of connective technology technology and lack of robust and reliable access to the internet, cell service, um, or mobile data for the top two challenges in both the summer and fall of 2020. Ambulatory care organizations have more issues with patients' lack of connective technology and lack of reimbursement policies than all of the other organizations. So, Cliff, as a partner to many healthcare organizations, what do you see when you look at these results? Yeah, you know, Patty, it's interesting. As I, as I stare at page 19, it, it lines up perfectly with our actual experience with providers in the marketplace. This is what we are hearing from our clients and prospects directly. For example, when you talk about heightened issues at practice or ambulatory kinds of organizations, they are often challenged with a lack of IT personnel or financial constraints. Uh, for telehealth. And, and that is especially true for those smaller organizations than it is for the larger ones. And overall, when you look at the top two challenges, they're related in that they are all about connectivity. Access and connectivity is something that your ICT vendors can and frankly must bring to the table. Uh, this sends us into the part of our study here where we really want to dive into what these provider organizations are looking for from their partners. Here we see that, you know, this access and the connectivity is critical. The ICT vendors have to deliver that. Patty, let's talk a little bit about what they need from their partners generally. That's exactly where we're headed, Cliff. So let's look at information and communication technology for ICT vendor partnerships and how these partnerships can be key to supporting metrics for telehealth success and overcoming these current challenges. So earlier, we asked how organizations are expecting to make decisions moving forward. And one of the questions revolved around the role of technology and infrastructure vendors. So there's a clear movement. Organizations view their technology and infrastructure vendors as key partners in decision-making about telehealth initiatives. And Cliff, that's a significant shift from summer 2020 when organizations didn't consider them to be central to telehealth decision-making. So what do you think accounts for that shift? What happened in these last several months Months that may have changed their minds? Well, Patty, you know, if you think about the successes and the challenges, where providers have stumbled, ICT partners could have supported them. And if you look at their successes, ICT partners can support those areas too. That at, the, at the end of the day, um, it is that access to the patient and to the provider that makes all of this work. And I think um, that as organizations, provider organizations, deploy telehealth, they become more acutely aware of that fact. And I think that is what's really driving the, the change in their mindset. Right. And harking back to the HIMSS research, Anatomy of Innovation, that study identified, among other things, the foundations and challenges of digital health innovation in hospitals and health systems. So this telehealth study reinforces what the Anatomy of Innovation study found, which is organizations' desire for a true strategic, strategic forward-thinking partnership with ICT vendors. So we asked organizations to identify six areas of focus for vendors looking to support telehealth offerings or sustainability. So number one, organizations see the call quality as make or break for telehealth. So as one respondent said, a picture is worth a thousand words, but not if the video quality sucks. And another said, we only have one chance to get this right with each patient. Number two, before patients can even see if the quality is good, they have to be able to reach the call itself. So for this reason, UX and UI, or user experience and user interface design are critical. And number three, they want equitable access for all patients. 
So organizations are also focused on requirements that go back pre-pandemic. So budget-friendly cost and enough revenue, platforms and systems that are integrated into the EHR and interoperable with other systems, and ICT basics of security, reliability, and customer service. So Cliff, what's your reaction when you hear this from stakeholders and what you do at Spectrum Enterprise? <laughs> well, well, Patty, the, the verbatims are always my favorite because this is where we get you know, a real sort of look at how uh, survey respondents are thinking and feeling. My favorite quote on this, I think that you just read to us was, a picture is worth a thousand words, but not if the video quality is horrible. That pretty much sums it up. And, and, and that's why this is one of my favorite charts. I, I look at this and I see how much ICT vendors can help these provider orgs deliver on this really important uh, care delivery method fiber-based connectivity services, and a partner who really understands telehealth is absolutely essential. We aren't surprised to, to hear this from providers, and frankly, not at all. It's what we have learned as we have been supporting these provider organizations for years and years, pre, during, uh, pre the pandemic and during the pandemic, and will continue to do so post. Um, Patty, Let's, let's drive into the last part of the study. Let's talk about applications and technology. Right. So finally, let's take a deep dive into what we learned about telehealth technology requirements themselves. So we asked survey respondents to rate on a five-point scale their overall level of satisfaction when it comes to for performance with the list of technologies you see here. So Secure Patient Portal ranks the highest followed by robust data connectivity at the organization, secure video platform to connect providers to patients, high data storage capacity at the organization, and managed network services at organizations. So you'll note that unified communications platforms at the patient end and provider end ranked the two lowest in terms of satisfaction. And also note that 13% were very dissatisfied or dissatisfied with robust data connectivity at the organization. So that begs the question, what does it take to move the needle here? So clearly there are areas within telehealth technologies that organizations need to bolster. So Cliff, how can ICT partners support organizations as they address these telehealth technology needs? Well, it's a good it's a good question, Patty. In, in fact, it's, it, that question is the reason that we performed this research in the first place. You know, our job is really to figure out you know the setup, the infrastructure that will thrill two two audiences: one, uh, care providers, clinicians, and two, patients. Quite frankly, our job is to make that 13% dissatisfaction that you see there on the right hand side of the chart. Uh, related to connectivity, our job is to make that 13% dissatisfaction disappear. The same is true for unified communications platforms at both ends. That 16 and that 18% dis, dis, uh, dissatisfaction rate, our job is to make that disappear. Great. So where do organizations expect to continue investing in technology to support connectivity and telehealth? So 94% of organizations expect to invest in some form of technology to support connectivity and telehealth. And this chart shows where those investments are expected to go. But let's look at differences among organization types, specifically between ambulatory and IDNs and hospitals. So robust data connectivity platform to connect providers and high data storage capacity are higher at IDNs and hospitals than ambulatory organizations. So that said, one third of ambulatory organizations expect to use, um, expect to be using unified communications. And that's the biggest jump in investment, by the way, during COVID to post COVID. So expectations of the demand are gonna be there. So Cliff, let's put a lens on ambulatory care organization. There seems to be a lot of opportunity to support them and really help boost their telehealth offerings. It, it's true. And it's interesting because we talked before about ambulatory organizations having this challenge around resources, budget, and IT staff, as an example. Managed services is one way that your ICT partner can help alleviate uh, some of those resource constraints uh, to deliver those connected services via telehealth. Really, your ICT vendor should be working with you to act as an extension of your IT organization. 
That's what that real partnership is, is frankly about. Most importantly for all providers, regardless of their size or geography, you know, it's important that you've got a partner that's really, that really understands the challenges that, that you're trying to solve for with these investments and how it all works together end to end to deliver those quality care experiences for your clinicians and most importantly for your patients. Now, Patty, I, I think the applications uh, that are, are supporting this infrastructure are up next. That's correct, Cliff. So we asked about new and expected technology investments. So healthcare-specific video conferencing platforms and mobile apps for tracking or monitoring patient wellness or vitals are expected to increase post-COVID. Larger organizations are planning on investing in healthcare-specific platforms at a higher percentage than their mid to small counterparts. IDNs and hospitals plan to invest in chatbots or other AI-assisted patient communications versus their ambulatory counterparts. And lastly, integration and interoperability continue to be important. So Cliff, what do these expected tech investments post-COVID tell us about where organizations are headed? Well, well not surprisingly, Patty, if you look at this, it's all about virtual health, connected care, and telehealth. They're answering the demand for these services. Remember, we talked about the, the, the fact several slides ago that it is patients that's really driving the demand here. Uh, they're answering this demand for these services and they will reap the benefits if they do it right. And every single one of these applications will require the robust connectivity at both the patient and the provider end. If you're going to invest in these apps, it is just absolutely critical that you get the connectivity right first in order to avoid issues later. Uh, and because uh, in, the, in the absence of connectivity, the, the truth is none of these apps matter. In the absence of connectivity, there is no telehealth. That really is the big takeaway, at least from my perspective. So Patty, why don't you uh, sum up what have we learned today? Bring us home if you would. We'll do, Cliff. So let's revisit the key takeaways from the research that we opened up with at the beginning of the webinar. So number one, telehealth adoption growth is expected to continue, and this allows organizations to focus on how to increase access and diversify services. Number two, government grant funding and organizational reserves remain top two funding sources. So telehealth is here to stay. You know, there are several bills in Congress to support telehealth post-pandemic, and organizations are earmarking reserves to keep telehealth growing, and again, that bodes well for telehealth 2.0. Number three, telehealth success and failure is dependent upon patient satisfaction and continued reimbursement. So with patient satisfaction as a metric, ICT partners can step up and provide organizations with high quality service and support. Number four, decision-making is shifting toward a long-term approach with many organizations viewing their ICT vendors as partners. So as organizations focus on making telehealth more effective for the long-term, they're really leaning in on their ICT vendors to help them build that strategy. And number five, as a partner, ICT vendors must provide top-level service and consultative support. And as our survey respondents noted in their comments, high-quality patient and provider experience is critical for continued use. And that's where ICT partners step in to be responsive service providers and hands-on consultants. So Cliff, any concluding thoughts on the key takeaways or the research overall? In fact, I do, Patty, I do have just a couple of wrap-up thoughts. Uh, team. It's important to remember what we're talking about today, these are not our opinions, these are your opinions, uh, as represented by more than 700 of you across all kinds of provider organizations. And what did you tell us? You told us three things. Number one, you told us that connectivity will be the biggest challenge that you face, that you have to overcome as you move forward to deploy telehealth. Number two, you told us that patient satisfaction and clinician experience are absolutely critical. And number three, you told us that you want and need an ICT vendor to act as your partner, act as an extension of your IT organization. You know, what we're actually talking about today is, is the start of a genuine revolution in care delivery. And connected care will continue to evolve and be innovated upon. This Digital Health Infrastructure Foundation 
will only become more and more critical going forward. So say all of you. Uh, this is incredibly exciting stuff. We're, we're excited to be on this digital health transformation journey with all of you. Patty, thank you very much. Absolutely, Cliff. Thank you for your insights. And thank you all for joining us today. So let's open this up for questions from the audience. Thank you, Patty and Cliff, for such a great presentation. What a wealth of insights. So we already have some questions from our audience. I will ask both of you the question and you can weigh in as you see fit. So first question, what is the difference between virtual health and telehealth? And can I think of it as though these findings apply to both? Um, so this is Patty. Yeah, so I, I can take that. So, you know, virtual health is just a broad umbrella of digital interaction with a patient. So I think the services we've discussed today all fall under the virtual care, virtual health umbrella. You know, so we can glean similar um, insights from the data. Um, having worked on many of our research projects, you know, I understand we have to be vigilant and, care and careful um, on misreporting, but I think it's a fair assessment to say the findings here, you know, are likely to apply to virtual health as well. Okay. Uh, next question. When it comes to tech satisfaction, I saw the satisfaction levels around connectivity to, connectivity to be pretty good at the organization level. But what about for patients themselves? How do providers feel about patient connectivity? Ha, uh, that's a good question. This is, this is Cliff. I'll, I'll take a, a swing at, at the answer to that question. You'll recall back on about page 24, we saw that providers rate patient side connectivity as their biggest challenge to overcome. Now, as networks continue to be built out, we see opportunities to help in this area. We, as your ICT partner, can really help address this challenge and, and help to move this forward. So, so they see it as a big challenge and it's a challenge that ICT vendors can help with. Okay, great, thank you, Cliff. Next question. In reality, do you see payers changing their attitude towards, towards telehealth reimbursement? And what role does the pandemic play in the decision-making? This is a part three. And once we have a vaccine, do you think they will change their, thought, their thoughts on reimbursement? And if you need any of those parts read over again, let me know. Great, um, thanks Martina. This is Patty and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take that uh, question. So, you know, the answer is a resounding yes. They are absolutely changing their attitude toward telehealth reimbursement. You know, as we discussed earlier, um, in, in talking about cost, um, you know, they, the government is absolutely 100% behind being able to support providers and um, and patients. So, uh, you, you know, a resounding yes. Um, but I but I think, um, you know, there's another aspect to it that we have to think about that's just as important. Um, you know, to keep telehealth going. Um, I think that the telehealth the the healthcare community has a responsibility, and and that's to come up with data around how and where telehealth can be delivered safely and efficiently and cost effectively, you know, and have the greatest impact, you know, through developed standards of care and best practices and, and quality measures. So this is what's really going to help um, in ensuring coverage in the long term. Okay, great. Thank you, Patty. Uh, next question. What changes to the telehealth outlook will occur if there is no funding from the government after the pandemic? Hmm. This is Cliff. I'll, I'll take a swing at that one. You know, as, as Patty suggested earlier, it's going to come down to demand and economics. Um, and it's going to force all of us to, to face some tough questions. What is the cost for a provider to not offer telehealth services when their competitor is offering them? Particularly in light of the fact that we know that it is patients who are demanding the proliferation of telehealth. Um, and the other economic question that we need to ask ourselves is, you know, what is the cost in delivering a service to a patient in a virtual way versus the same cost uh, in a brick and mortar facility? Ultimately, we know that there is going to be demand uh, for, for these services. The, the results here are abundantly clear. And we also know that the government, as we indicated, uh, I think back on page 15, the government is really interested in investing in this. 
So I, I feel incredibly positive about the telehealth outlook. We all know that this uh, mode of care delivery is here to stay, and we know that the economics support it as well. Great, thank you so much, Cliff. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions right now. Um, I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to your question during the webinar today, but we will try and connect offline. Uh, Cliff, would you like to wrap things up for us today? Yeah, I, I would. Team, uh, thank you for, for joining us today. We know that your time is incredibly valuable, and especially right now, we know that your time is in increasingly short supply. We very much appreciate, it, appreciate you investing an hour with us, and hopefully you, you've learned something today, um, and, and we hope that you've learned something that can support the telehealth journey that we know your organization is already on. As always, we here at Spectrum Enterprise continue this conversation with you, and we continue to deliver these insights. We want to be your strategic healthcare ICT partner. I hope that you found our session today informative, and I hope that your afternoon is great. Thank you very much. Cliff and Patty, thank you again for a great webinar today, um, and thank you Spectrum Enterprise for sponsoring this webinar. Please be sure to complete the evaluation at the conclusion of today's event and share your thoughts with us. As a reminder, today's session will be available on demand for one year through the HIMSS Learning Center. Thank you and have a great day.